the most influential drummers are always those who take inspiration from different styles. Like a metal drummer would take an inspiration from Latin music. People who've been playing for 10 years, 15 years, but they took shortcuts early on, now are lacking some basics. Even if they're you know, already professional musicians, uh, they struggle with very basic things. But I think it's very important that when you're practicing, you're not in a comfort zone. That's the only way that you can really achieve goals and, and produce changes in your playing. Hola amigos, hello friends, from Cartagena, Spain, to the five continents and the universe, uh, we are connecting today with an artist who doesn't need uh, introduction, but just in case, I will see something. He's not only an incredible drummer, he's also a producer, composer, his educational career is remarkable, he's been drumming for Beyoncé, Robin Williams, Tina Turner, Falco, George Michael, Peter Gabriel, uh, Paul Gilbert, and with two solo albums and his own projects like his band Stork. Folks, this is a great moment. Please welcome Mr. Thomas Lang. Hi, Thomas. How are you? Hola, Juan. I'm very good. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great pleasure uh, having you here. We will talk about the music, uh, the touring life, practicing, technology, your great uh, uh, online drama school, and anything you want to bring uh, to bring to the table. Are you okay with that, Thomas? Absolutely, yes. Great. First question, uh, where are you now and what are you doing these days? Well, I am very busy uh, doing a lot of recording sessions from my studio here in Los Angeles for, you know, clients all over the world. Um, I do a lot of remote sessions. People send me files and I play drums here in my studio and send them back. As you know, that's, you know, the new uh, way of doing things, you know, a lot of the times uh, these days. And uh, I'm also working on a solo album, which I'm planning to release in the summer this year. That's great. Um, and, uh, of course I've got my online school that I take care of. I'm, you know, planning a lot of camps and educational events for this year, uh, including another big drum bonanza here in Los Angeles in July and several, uh, Thomas Lang drumming boot camps all over the world. And, uh, yeah, and I'm, you know, I'm writing and producing uh, every day, spending a lot of time in the studio. <laughs> About modern times, Thomas, we're having a video conversation right now uh, in real time for you and me, and it's being recorded uh, for many people in the future. We are thousands and thousands of miles away. We could uh, make an album, an online record right now, in this very moment, uh, me playing the tambourine and you playing the rest of instruments uh, and release the album uh, to the world uh, tomorrow. This, this is not uh, the future, it's the present. Uh, two, two questions, uh, Thomas. Could you imagine uh, some decades ago that this was uh, going to be possible? And how do you get along with, uh, with technology uh, related to your music life? Um, well, to answer your first question, I've been doing this for about 10 years, uh, recording in my um, studio, you know, for clients all over the place. Um, you know, and as soon as technology was, you know, ready to do this, I Yes, I, I think I saw the future and uh, I realized that this was the way to go. Um, I think I've even, even been doing this for, for more than 10 years. Um, but, you know, 30 years ago, no, definitely not. I didn't have, you know, I didn't think that this would become the, the standard recording process because for me, making music was always a social experience you know you are with other people uh, in the studio uh, playing rehearsing writing together and um, it's of course technology helps us to you know record with much lower budgets these days because every musician pretty much today has their own studio and and it saves a lot of money and also time to do it this way but um, it is not a social and uh, and often not as fun because it's always you know more fun to be in a room with other people and be creative yeah um but um anyways uh, that's the way it is right now and i think I, you know i can be very productive this way and i can save a lot of people a lot of money uh because you eliminate all the travel costs and catering and hotels and everything else so uh there are, there are many positive aspects to this um 
and uh, and I think it's the way forward. You know, I don't think um, it, this will change much. This allows a lot of people to work together who wouldn't have a chance to work together otherwise. Yeah. So it's a it's a very positive thing. And um, to answer your second question about technology and how, how I deal with it and 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 um, how if I feel comfortable with it, yes, absolutely. You know, I'm. I'm very interested in in using uh, you know new technologies to be creative, and uh, and I think there are incredible developments in the world of technology in general, but specifically in regards to music that are extremely helpful and um, and allow us to work a lot more efficiently uh, and cheaply, uh, especially on recording projects. So yes, I, I'm. I'm a, a real techie in that respect, and I try to educate myself and learn new uh, software regularly. So I try to stay up to date with everything. And this brings to the table a concept that, that I love, the autoproduction, the, the high level uh, autoproduction, Thomas. We have to learn uh, many things, a part of drumming uh, and playing in, in these modern days. But one thing that remains the same is that in a studio, live, super production or home production is that we have to be good uh, and that means many many hours many many years of practice uh, of good and productive uh, practice some tips about how to take the most from our practice session uh, in order to improve in every in every session thomas um well i think it's important to have a good practice plan i have always had a very methodical approach to practicing I always set goals, um, and my practice was always result-oriented. Um, and I think this is very important. There's a lot of musicians who never learn to practice properly. And I was very lucky to have a teacher who taught me how to practice very on. In my first you know, four or five weeks of, of playing the drums, um, we did nothing but talk about practice, what practice is, what the practice rules are, how to keep a practice log, Um, how to set goals and achieve the goals, short term and long term, etc., and and how to actually physically and mentally focus during practice, and how to control yourself, how to check and analyze your results and your progress, etc. So I've always had a very analytical and methodical approach to practicing, and I think this uh, was very beneficial for me and uh, allowed me to pursue you know, progress very, very deliberately and with a plan. And I think it made a difference between my practicing and, and other uh, people's practicing. Um, and uh, my recommendation to anybody out there who is struggling with progress is keep a practice log. It, it could be a calendar, it could be a digital, you know, log, like a daily routine app or something on your phone. Um, and Be, set goals, you know, find out what kind of a drummer you want to be, uh, what specific, uh, you know, technical and musical goals you have. Um, make sure that you hone sort of a, or develop a, a creative uh, form of practice, which is, I think, extremely important because we are in the creative business in, in making music. Um, and of course, practice regularly have a practice log where you write down how much you practice every day, what you practice every day, subdivide your practice time in, into manageable chapters, um, keep it interesting for yourself in every session, try to divide your time, it may be three important chapters and don't overload yourself with too much information, make sure that whatever you are practicing will manifest in quality of your, of your performance, not in quantity of hours, it doesn't matter how long you practice, as long as you get the result. So the, the quality of the practice is always the result. And uh, and set a lot of goals, regular goal setting, weekly, monthly, you know, yearly goals. And, um, and check on yourself always. Uh, make sure that it's regular practice, that it's as much practice as you can get in terms of hours. Uh, make sure that you keep a log of, of tempo, uh, Uh, changes, you know, uh, and and in, in, uh, increase in tempo regarding whatever, and uh, and work towards goals. So, um, random practice is not very 
uh, efficient. You know, a lot of musicians sit down and, you know, don't really know what to practice that day. So they start jamming and playing. And of course, jamming is and playing means that you're doing something you've already done before. You're just repeating uh, certain things and going through the motions and you're in your comfort zone. But I think it's very important that when you're practicing, you're not in a comfort zone. You, you're trying to learn something new and develop a new idea. And uh, that's usually a difficult process and very frustrating. But um, that's the only way that you can really achieve goals and, and produce changes in your playing rather than just constantly repeating things that you've already practiced. About uh, concentration and focus, let's say that we have a decent amount of time, let's say two, four hours. Uh, we are individuals and each person has his own uh, way or his maximum time of concentration, focus on the same material, maybe 20 minutes uh, or whatever. Our attention span. In your case, how to deal with that? Uh, in your case, for example, uh, how much time on the same new thing? You know, I agree that, you know, uh extreme focus on one thing is extremely tiring and that's why i mentioned earlier i think it's important to subdivide your practice time into different things and you know one if you have you know three hours of practicing for example then you can take one hour and and spend it on something that is mentally taxing and and difficult that requires a lot of focus and concentration and usually after an hour you're pretty exhausted mentally um, and it becomes difficult to focus. Then I would spend another hour on something that requires no focus at all, which is just repetitive motions, technique and so on. Then, you know, get your head space, you know, out of that, you know, intense focus um, sort of, you know, environment and, and do something that's maybe more physical that requires less concentration. And then maybe on the third hour, if you have three hours, uh, do something that is more creative. You know, experiment with things, try to come to work your, you know, practice material into your playing and uh, and play some music, uh, think about dynamics and expression and things like that. So I think it's important not to overexert yourself and, and, and wear yourself out with with one thing at a time for too long. I think it's important to stay mentally flexible and be able to focus on different things in each session. Uh, and uh, and have each hour that you dedicate to different things uh, be a success in itself in terms of practice, you know, to achieve an actual goal. The goal may be an increase in hand speed or something over this one hour. Uh, you know, if it's a technical ex exercise, the goal may be to be able to learn a new sort of coordination pattern or something in another hour. And the other goal may be to be extremely dynamic in, in your playing, you know, when you're playing ghost notes or something, you know. So I think it's important to to mix it up a little bit in every practice session. Um, and over the years, I've, I've learned to be able to stay focused for quite a long period of time. Um, but I know for myself, after three hours of one thing, say I have eight hours to practice or something, after three hours, you know, I, I find it difficult to focus on, you know, one thing at a time. So I usually mix it up after that and do something completely different. Just play music or just experiment and uh, think creatively and not in a very methodical way. And then maybe later, you know, maybe I'll take a break and then I'll be able to return to doing something that requires a lot of focus. But, you know, we all need a break. And I think you learn over the years of, of practicing with a lot of focus and, and methodical practice, you learn to focus for longer periods of time. You know, a beginner can maybe only do five to 10 minutes at a time. But I think the more you do it, the more, you know, you learn how to practice and how to focus for longer periods of time. And that makes a big difference, of course, in your, in your practicing results. <laughs> That's great information, Thomas, about learning without uh, our instrument. I think that we can also uh, learn so much uh, without our instrument, especially when we haven't the set close or available for playing or practicing. How to improve our playing, but 
without uh, our instrument? Um, I think um, the only way you can improve is is maybe by listening to music, analyzing uh, music, uh, and um, and finding inspiration. You know, when you can't actively play, whether it's on the drum set or on a practice pad, I think it's important to educate yourself maybe uh, and use that time to learn about new styles of music, to maybe analyze some of your favorite music, and to think about musical concepts um, and and think creatively about your own playing, uh, contemplate a little bit, you know, what you're doing that is you know, that you like or what you don't like in your playing, maybe make lists of things you want to change, uh, maybe, you know, think back at, at performances uh, in the past and mistakes that you've made and maybe make a list of your weaknesses that you can find in your playing, etc. There's a lot of kind of conceptual stuff you can do all the time. Um, and of course, you can listen to music, which is just as important for to learn about, you know, authentic performances, you know, in different world music styles, for example, whether it's Latin or Indian music or whatever, just to have some inspiration and to hear, you know, great performers play and analyze their playing. That's something you can do. But in terms of uh, physical practice, which is really the most important thing, there's nothing you can do unless you bring a practice pad on the road and maybe a kick drum pad and a pedal and set it up and do some actual practicing. It's like saying, um, with, you know, without drums and drumsticks, um, uh, it's like saying I'm going to the gym, you know, but I'm not working out. I'm not touching any equipment, you know what I mean? <laughs> and you expect to get better. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. Um, you actually have to do it hands-on. You have to have the sticks in your hands and actually play the patterns because this is as, as much kinesthetic memory, muscle memory, as it is sort of a mental uh, exercise to practice. So the combination is what matters and what makes it, uh, you know, uh, successful. I think that every player has a groove, an exercise, a method page uh, that changed his learning experience uh, before and after in our learning journey. Maybe a Latin groove, maybe uh, learning how to play uh, ghost notes, uh, a thing, uh, a lesson that means a boost in our, in, uh, in our playing. What was that uh, specific boost um, for you, Thomas? The thing that opened uh, the door for a big step in your, in your playing. One extremely important book for me was a book by an Austrian drummer called, um, his name was um, Erich Bachträger. He was uh, a teacher at the conservatory. And he wrote a book called The Rhythm and Reading Script, which blew my mind, you know, in, in my early sort of teens, because it was a book that um, would train you to read, Yes. Of course, but not read easy parts, quite complex parts with, you know, you know, interesting rhythms with each limb played dynamically. So there were dynamic fluctuations in each limb uh, and you have all four limbs put together with, you know, accents on the kick drum and soft notes, ghost notes on the kick drum. Um, same with the hi-hat and not just eight notes and 60 notes or whatever. They were actually syncopated patterns. Uh, it was, my mind was completely blown because I'd never heard anybody who was that dynamic with four limbs at the same time, but different dynamics, you know? And that to me was mind blowing because it was just proof of, of utter control, you know, and, and a lot of musical thought in, in his playing and performance. Um, and that really sort of opened my mind and, and made me rethink everything on the drums very much. Um, so that was a big one. And I spent years and years practicing from that book. Um, and of course, other books at the time that were very important in my development, Stick Control, you know, by Lawrence Stone, um, Master Studies by Joe Morello, a really incredible book, The New Breed for groove coordination and ostinados and so on. 
And another book called Four Way Coordination, which was very, very important for me um, because I, I was able to develop my own kind of system of practicing coordination that it, that book inspired that. Uh, which is a system that I later put in a DVD called The Matrix and Jim Chapin's book, you know, Advanced Studies for the Modern Drummer, which is jazz coordination. Uh, those books um, had a huge impact on my sort of view on drumming, um, on sort of musical expression in general, and on the possibilities that are out there and all the unexplored stuff that's still out there. There is a mantra that surrounds to any player that has a great uh, technique or facility on the instrument. Uh, Thomas, about that uh, universal mantra that says that if you have good technique, then you don't have soul, you can't groove, you don't have uh, feeling. Uh, I think that the history of art and humanity is full of examples of incredible composers, incredible players with full of soul. Ella Figueral, Bach, Michelangelo, Stevie Wonder. Uh, what do you think about uh, that mantra, the technique, soul, uh, pocket uh, thing? I think, it's, I think it's complete nonsense. It's usually the people who have no technique who say these things. <laughs> And yes, there is great, you know, soulful music that is um, non-technical, of course. And there is great soulful music that is very technical. If you look at Mozart, uh, you know, or Rachmaninoff, Uh, or, you know, all the great classic composers. This is absolutely beautiful music full of emotion and soul and expression. And that is ultra technical at the same time or Bach or whatever, you know. So that's nonsense, you know, unless these people think that Mozart is non-musical, which, <laughs> you know, I, I have no opinion about that. Yeah. I, I don't think it's true. And in fact, you, yes, you can make soulful music without much technique for sure but the same goes for technical music technical music can just be as soulful it's just a different way of expressing yourself it's like saying shakespeare is not soulful because it has complicated language you know what i mean any kind of beatnik you know poem is no more soulful than classic shakespeare or something you know it's just the way that the individual expresses himself and and makes their personality shine through the music And some people have maybe a little bit a more complex personality and that manifests in more complex and more technical playing. And other people, you know, maybe are a little bit more simple minded and say things that are very simple and straightforward, but also is, you know, beautiful and, and meaningful. Absolutely. And uh, I don't judge whether, you know, the one or the other is more emotional or more soulful or, or easier to understand. That's up to the to the listener to decide, and that's where taste comes into play. You know, it's just a matter of taste. Some people like, you know, hamburgers, other people don't. It doesn't make one or the other person better or worse or whatever. It's just different forms of expression, and for me, it's all good. I personally, you know, I hear this a lot, you know, that, you know, anything technical is not musical or soulful. Uh, you know, what do you say to that? It's just a matter of taste. It's not true. There is no, you know, actual uh, sort of proof for that. It's just a matter of taste. It's all music, you know. About learning many styles, Thomas, uh, many people have the impression that learning many styles will steal your personality, your soul. For example, a heavy metal drummer uh, thinking that learning some Latin stuff uh, is not uh, useful. How uh, learning many styles can make us stronger no matter what's your, uh, your own main band or music? Yes, I agree. I think um, the more you know about different styles of music, uh, the more interesting your playing becomes. The more influences you kind of internalize, the the more complex, you know, your knowledge becomes of all kinds of music and the more 
tools you have at your disposal to express what you're trying to say. And I think it's actually very hip to uh, mix different world music styles in sort of cliche uh, genres, you know? Metal is a very cliche genre. Uh, and if you listen to Eloy Casagrande or something from Sepultura, he has a lot of Latin influences in his playing, which I think makes his heavy and metal playing a lot more interesting and fun to check out. And, and which sort of uh, makes him a more interesting and different metal drummer. And of course, I think that, you know, that goes for every style. Anybody who can take influences from places where other people don't take their influences from becomes more interesting. You know, that's why Stuart Copeland to me is a super interesting drummer because he has a lot of Arabic uh, music style influences in his playing because he grew up in Beirut and so on. And he mixes Jamaican uh, you know, reggae vibes with, you know, Arabic uh, music and and punk. That was a very unique combination and made him a super interesting drummer. And still to this day, I think he's one of the most unique sounding uh, drummers in the world with really quirky and different ideas, which are very hip. And the same goes for other people. Cobham had, you know, a, a really strong marching uh, tradition and Steve Gadd, for example, they have this marching experience that manifests in their playing and made their playing completely different from everybody else's at the time. You know, uh, you know, Cobham super clean single stroke rolls and kind of marching patterns on the snare drum in a funk context were really new. And the same goes for Gadd, you know, and he took rudiments and put them on the kit like nobody else before. So the the really the most influential drummers are always those who take inspiration from different styles. Like a metal drummer would take an inspiration from Latin music. Yeah. I think that is actually what matters and makes makes people uh, more interesting to listen to and 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 is a is a clear proof of some out of the box thinking, you know, which is creative. And that's what I li listen uh, look for in a drummer. I want to hear something that is creative. And talking about the styles, you produced a record with Mr. Simon Phillips and Mr. Charlie Watts played on those sessions. I think that was the first session ever for Charlie. Yes, I think so. <laughs> That's what he said. How do you describe Charlie's style and, and what do you think about him when you listen to him playing in the studio live and having his tracks on a screen. How do you describe Charlie Watts' style? Well, you know, to be honest, I was never a big Charlie Watts fan until I met him and, and worked with him and saw him. You know, before I met him, I looked at him as a very, you know, simple player who was not very flash. He was always kind of humble and, 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 and discreet in the background, which is kind of his personality anyways. Yeah. You know, talking about personality. So, you know, he, he never struck me as, as somebody very impressive, you know. And when I grew up, of course, I was looking for, you know, the more, most sort of impressive drummers that kind of caught my eye. And he was never that guy. He was, you know, quite humble and uh, and always in the background. But after meeting him and, and really analyzing his playing, I realized that there are so many idiosyncrasies and, and 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 unique little elements in his playing that are just pure personality and i i fell in love his, with his playing then um he has obviously you know the very typical johnny watts thing where he doesn't play the hi-hat when he plays the backbeat you know which exposes the hot the snare drum on every backbeat which is very unique because it's always just a single instrument it's never together with the hi-hat which gives the, the snare drum a clarity uh, that other you know drummers when you play both at the same time don't have and interestingly enough he also does it when he plays the right sim <laughs> although he wouldn't have to you know but it gives the snare drum a slight delay it's a little bit laid back which feels great and and it's totally exposed uh, and just stands alone which gives his groove a, a, a weight that is really really interesting um, and he's he leads everything of course with the right hand always and he's always right hand heavy in his fills and everything and plays little buzz rolls with his left hand instead of you know e's and r's as clean 60 notes he often plays just slightly sloppy left hand e's and r's with a tiny buzz roll in them which is also a very unique little flair and 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 um touch um and you know that makes amongst many other things 
and his sound and the choice of his but he doesn't have a you know a crash symbol you know he has a china or right symbols and, and crash symbols and he just has a very unique sound on this tiny minimalistic kit you know he he manages to infuse this very small you know classic four-piece drum set that he has with a lot of personality absolutely and uh and of course you know all the classic songs he's played with the stones and all that kind of stuff that's a different thing in terms of pop culture and music history but just his drumming in, in itself is is uh, it just oozes with with personality and after meeting him personally and spending some time with him it's just beautiful to see how his you know very calm and and very discreet but very elegant and stylish personality and nature translates into his playing and it's a perfect mirror image of that you know so yeah now i love charlie watts <laughs> about recording and sound. When you listen to a recording from the 80s, you can hear every detail in the drums, in the vocals, on the guitar, everything. And uh, with no samples, no sound replacement, no beat detective, it was clear and dynamic. Uh, what do you think about the use or overuse of samples, uh, especially in drums uh, in the pop rock context? Is it the standard uh, right now? Uh, what do you think? Um, yes, and I don't like it. You know, um, I like, music in general not just drum recordings but you know i like recorded music when you where you hear uh, a human being perform something and uh, you know as a as a musician and producer myself i can immediately tell the difference if this is a a real human performance with charming imperfections uh, and dynamics and constant changes in development in the flow of the song or whether this is just some machine that was well programmed, you know, and I, it doesn't touch me as much personally. If I hear, you know, a perfect drum take with sound replacement and beat detective and quantization and all that, you know, first of all, I, as a producer, I know all these samples, I know the BFD samples and tune track, all the samples that people use. And I think they're, they're grossly overused and, it, those, you know, using those samples, yes, gives you a kind of standard rock sound or whatever you're going for, but it also kind of subtracts all personality from the performance. And I think it's really, it's it's a pity, it's a shame, and it's it's boring. And uh, you know, if I if you go to tune into any kind of um, rock station on the radio here in the states, especially. On every station, you hear the same samples, and you know the super fat, you know, ba uh, snare drums with a lot of bottom end that almost sound like kick drums, you know, that are so popular in in in, in rock today. You know, it's just it it does nothing for me, and it's not it it doesn't make the music better. I think it actually takes away a lot of the impact that the music could potentially have because it takes away the personality of the musician, the drummer himself, and also the band in, in context. Yeah. So what I like, like I said, is is real handmade music where you can tell this is a, per, a person playing the drums. I like to hear, you know, the room in the recounting. I want to be able to identify whether this is a tom-tom or a concert tom, what kind of heads they were using, if it's open, the tuning, or if there's muffling on the head, how big the room was, and all that kind of stuff, and what the touch is of the drummer. You can tell these things, you know, from 70s recordings or, or early 80s recordings even. If you listen to, you know, Hal Blaine, who sadly just passed away a couple days ago, I was always a big Hal Blaine fan, you can hear exactly you know, how he struck the drum, you know, what kind of drum it was, whether it was a tom-tom or a concert tom, how it was tuned, how it was muffled, how big the room was. You can tell that by the actual, you know, great audio recording, which is beautiful, you know, my great microphones in a simple room with a, you know, interesting sounding drum set and just a great dynamic human performance with imperfections, of course. And that's what makes it so charming. So I'm a big fan of, you know, 70s disco music um, and you can hear the great drummers play and even if there's slight imperfections, it just feels great to me, it sounds great to me. And if you listen to Neil Peart, you know, 
an Eddie Rush recording or a Stuart Copeland, any of those recordings or anything from that era. Those were real drums. Imagine Stuart Copeland playing a police song with those kind of samples today, you know what I mean? Or even like Brian Adams or, you know, any of those. It would sound terrible and it's a joke. And now, like I said, it, there's such an overkill of, of samples out there. Uh, it's a it's a pity. And I'm old school. I everything I record, I do live takes. I record the whole song so I can get a nice flow throughout the song. I only do punch ins if I made a mistake or something somewhere. Um, but I'd rather then if I'm in my own studio just do the whole take again because I want the flow and the energy of the whole flow of the song. And and I want no sound replacement because it just sounds more interesting and has more personality. You can hear the drums, you can hear the cymbals, the way they are in that room and capture that moment, you know. About the sound in the room. Every room has a sweet spot, that place that you can put a mono microphone and it uh, captures the best uh, sound of the room. And then you treat it as you, as you want, according to the production, style, uh, the music. Uh, do you use a, a mono mic, uh, some usual places, that beautiful and magical spot uh, on the room? Yes, I, well, I, I, I use several uh, mono and stereo uh, ambience mics for my drum set. And I have uh, two favorite, actually three favorite uh, positions, depending on the style of music. My most favorite is what I call a low front ambience mic and I use a stereo mic for that I use a stereo condenser it could be you know uh, an, an audix uh, or an AKG or whatever I have different microphones that I use for that uh, or a Neumann but I capture I put it right in front of the kick drum maybe uh, two meters uh, not even maybe a meter and a half away from the kick drum um, at about um, you know 40 centimeters off the ground mm -hmm. And it captures the whole drum set from the front with a really good amount of low end from the bass drum and also uh, a very clear backbeat, like snare drum sound. And the rest of the kit in a good balance. You can hear the toms really well and you get enough overheads without the overheads and cymbals to be too washy and messy, you know? Yeah. So, and that alone, that mic alone, makes for a great drum sound. Only one mic, you know, almost like, you know, Bonham uh, style. It captures the whole kit with with enough kick drum to sound balanced. That's my by far my favorite sort of close ambience mic. Um, then I have a second one that I uh, use frequently, which is also, it's a mono mic placed under my snare, but close to the bass drum. It's kind of, if you think about the snare bottom mic that points at the wires, like a condenser mic pointing at the wires, uh, I, I put another mic close to the ground and a little bit further towards the bass drum, quite close to the bass drum pedal. And that captures a great mono kind of combination of kick and snare drum that you then can compress or EQ a little bit, but often you don't even need that. But you get that push um, from, you know, the two important components, kick and snare. And that's called a core mic, usually. Um, so the core mic is, is my other favorite. And the third favorite that I like is, is one right above my head, behind my, my head, which gives the impression of hearing the drums from the drummer's point of view. And I used to use a, a Neumann artificial head for that, which is a very expensive, great microphone. Uh, I don't have that anymore, but now I use just a, a stereo condenser uh, mic, a CSX-125 Audix. And, uh, and that just captures the drum set from my perspective, the way I hear it when I play. And I find in, a, uh, in certain contexts, like more dynamic music, softer music, that's a really nice... Uh, overall drum sound, which is not as kick heavy, and if you want, you can then dial in the internal miking of the kick or whatever. Uh, but it gives you a really nice overall ambient sound of the drum set. 
about your online drama school and your educational work uh, uh, with so many clinics, uh, so many questions for, from the audience and so many person-to-person -person lessons. What are the aspects uh, that you think the drummers uh, or players or musicians have their biggest uh, weakness, uh, don't work uh, properly or what's the material that they overlook the most? Um, I think, you know, one of a lot of the questions I get are about practicing and uh, and how to practice with uh, uh, you know a methodical approach and how to get better practice results and how to get uh, to the finish line faster because <laughs> um, that's what everybody wants to do everybody wants to practice as little as possible and get as much uh, um, development out of it as possible of course that doesn't work that, like that so I get a lot of The question about practicing. I think what people overlook is the effort it takes to do something really well. You know, the time you have to spend doing it. I think a lot of people um, or younger musicians think that you can just do it in a, in a few years and get to a very high level of playing you know, without taking sh shortcuts. And that's not true. You, you know, you, you can, you know, be very good and specialize in something in a few years. You can get to a you know, great level in one specific area, no problem. But that means that you did take a lot of shortcuts and which weakens your foundation for everything else that you want to, you know, pile up on top of that level that you've reached. And you see a lot of people get frustrated then after years. So I have a lot, I get a lot of questions that are in respect to that frustration. So, you know, people who've been playing for 10 years, 15 years, but they took shortcuts early on in their development and in their practicing um, and now are lacking some basics. And those uh, make it difficult on a daily basis, even if they're, you know, already professional musicians. Uh, they struggle with very basic things, you know, and those things could be technical things, you know, maybe a lack of rudimental practice and stick control. Um, they they can result in injury, you know, and all sorts of tendonitis and carpal tunnel and, you know, all these kind of issues uh, as a result of bad technique. Um, and um, and it, it, it always results in, in frustration with your own playing because you always sound the same and you do the same stuff over and over and over again. And there's no real creativity in your playing, uh, which is also a result of taking shortcuts early in your practicing career. There is a word that uh, is told from Herbie Hancock talking about mistakes and learning from other people. Uh, and it's the word growing. We must grow and learning is the key for that. Uh, uh, and we can learn so much from others who don't play our instrument or even no musicians. What what concrete experience, advice or, or, or thought from, others, from other players, non-drummers, made you a, a, a better musician, a, a better player? Something said uh, by others that affected Uh, directly on your playing. I remember, you know, one of the first uh, real kind of steep learning curves was in one of my first studio recording sessions, which was in Austria many, many years ago in the 80s uh, with an Italian singer named uh, Etta Scolo at the time, who was, you know, she had some number one hits in Austria at the time. She was Italian and I was working with her and recording with her. and. Um, And we were recording one of the songs, which is the basic rock song. And, you know, as a drummer and young, excited drummer, I felt compelled to, you know, put in cool licks wherever I could <laughs> and just overplay the song. And, you know, we played the song three, four times and listened back to it. And I thought it was really cool because it had all these cool drum things in it. And, uh, and everybody else was just Nah, it's not right. It feels terrible, and and the song has no point, and it sounds like like um, something's wrong with it, and there's too much drumming on it, and weird fills in the, in the wrong places that that are not idiomatically correct. Fills that sound like the drummer wants to show off a fill and is not playing a song. He's just thinking about himself and not about the song. And um, of course, you know, I you know always willing to learn 
um, after a few takes said, okay, well then I'll, I'll just do something that is completely different that maybe is more what you expect. And I played a very, very simple and straightforward uh, take with very basic uh, fills. And we listened back and it was a, sounded great, exactly what the song needed. And, and it had just the right amount of, of minute little fills and with the sound that the engineer had dialed up, which was quite a big drum sound. Now the drums sounded really huge because there was more space between the notes. There were no ghost notes. There was no trickiness in it. And every note just had its own place and weight and, and spot. And it really drove the song in a completely different way. And you could actually feel the, the, the groove now with all the space between the notes and nothing filled up with ghost notes. So that was a really important uh, learning curve for me, which was something that the guitar the guitar player pulled me to the side on the way to the recording. And he said to me, no, you know, you don't make us sound good. Just, you know, do me a favor and, and play much, much simpler and just do something that so we all have the space and we can all play the song together and yeah and so that was a very important thing and i i heard the result immediately uh and and that was you know a really a, a moment of revelation where i went oh okay i'm stupid uh, thank you you know it's amazing now and and we did the whole record like that of course and it's it still sounds great today you know very simple so that was one thing uh, in terms of of functionality. One thing I learned from other musicians was, you know, the importance of simplicity, um, the importance of accuracy, the importance of feel, you know, on the drum set and tightness with the band, uh, and the importance of, of teamwork and, and playing with a group of people for the song without ego and leaving enough space for everybody to contribute equally. To the song so that was a really important thing um, in terms of creativity which is something else than functionality you know in terms of creativity um from working with really great musicians over the years of I've, I've learned to be more daring and experimental in my playing and not caring about other people's opinions and and a taste and not being embarrassed about having your own ideas and actually presenting themselves that's i think very important and you know we all feel uh, self-conscious when we you know present something that we've written or we came up with in our rehearsal room to the world um and i've learned from great musicians that what matters is that you can stand behind what you do creatively and that no matter whether somebody likes it or not, that's not the point. The point is that, you know, you feel the urge to say something and, and present something the way you like to hear it, according to your creative vision. And and you have to, you know, have to develop the confidence in, in, in that kind of expression. And working with great musicians taught me that, that, you know, it's okay to do something that is weird and quirky and, but, you know, creative and different. And I think uh, it's important to make no compromises and and let your personality shine through in your own music, whatever it is, whether you're a singer or a guitar player, whatever. But find your own sound, your personality in the music, and don't copy everybody else all the time, and don't look for inspiration only outside, also inside. It's very important. And uh, some of the mo things that I'm most proud of are those things where you know I was able to to do something with you know without feeling insecure about it or self-conscious about something um and and letting my ideas just flow uh, freely and creatively um and in terms of of maybe uh career and, and work what i've learned from other musicians non-drummers is that it's really important to finish stuff you know even even if they're imperfect you know, there's a lot of, uh, I see, and I've many times been involved in projects that were really great and, and were going smoothly up to a certain point and then they, you know, uh, they stopped and were never released for whatever reasons, different reasons. But I think if you, if you do something, no matter if it's perfect or not, I think it's important to finish it and move on and to finish it and release it if you can 
uh, put it out, even if you think you could have done a better job, you know, with much more time investment. Um, I think it's okay to put out things that are imperfect. And it's important to put out things that are imperfect because they can be very charming. And most people don't even consider those things imperfections. They're just charming details that make something very special because we are so involved in what we do. We look at everything under the microscope, um, but your your fans and your listeners don't. You know, they, uh, they, they can appreciate the fact that it's finished and available. <laughs> about influences, you always say that you don't have only a, a, a favorite drummer as your main influence, but you always name Stuart Copeland because he brought new things to the music. And Ben Nicola Utah, yes. as one of the few players that plays uh, creative and challenging things for you. How do you describe uh, Benny's playing and Stuart Copeland playing? And why do you think that uh, these two players are so special? Um, I think Benny is a very technical drummer who uses you know his uh, technique uh, in a very unique uh, way that lets his personality really shine i think he's a very uh, versatile drummer who's comfortable in many different styles of music and at the same time he always manages to sound like himself even if he plays whether it's latin music or jazz or or rock He manages to to put a stamp of his personality and his ideas onto everything he does, which I find very uh, beautiful and inspiring. He is a, a, guy, a drummer who focuses on energy and dynamics a lot. Um, and it doesn't matter what it is exactly that he plays. Um, he can analyze everything and think ahead and execute something Um, that is pre-planned and executed perfectly, um, like in, 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 in what people call chops. You know, you practice a certain thing and then you execute it perfectly and you know where to play it and how to play it and how to orchestrate it and then you put it there. So he has that quality, but he also has a, 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 a what I appreciate even more, is a, a quality that is the element of surprise and improvisation in his playing And then uh, that's something completely unpredictable, both for the v the listener and for Vinny. He goes out on a limb. On a limb, he's very daring in his playing, and he will play things where he doesn't know where it's going, but he feels secure in his technical uh, ability to pull it off, no matter what. And and with his experience and and you know years and years of playing, he know he can save it, no matter what happens. And he can turn any kind of potential mistake in a really exciting uh, musical surprise, Absolutely. you know. And I really like that about his playing. It's very exciting because he he dares so much and he takes so many risks in his playing. That makes it very very special. And and I think that's what also most drummers, including myself, find inspiring. That you know he'll he'll just go off into a crazy wild direction, um, and uh, with the confidence that is is beautiful you know and he's an incredible listener you know even he's he's you know even when he plays something complex he manages to listen to the rest of the band at all times the, the confidence comes from practice and from experience you know uh, so you can hear in everything he does there's that so much practicing and thinking went into what he did over the years that it now just feels comfortable even if it's you know the most um bizarre risks that he's taken you know I, i i find that very exciting and stewart is similar to me stewart is full of surprises in his playing you know he plays some very left field kind of stuff that's that's really quirky and strange you know that is uh, because it's inspired by unusual styles of music you know arabic and you know jamaican and so on so he puts accents in strange places and A lot of his grooves don't have backbeats, or the backbeats are not on the two and the four, you know, and it's all a little upside down, um, and that's what I like about his playing. It's also, again, personality. There's so much personality, interesting sound, splash cymbals, and octobonds, and this very high cranked snare drum, and bizarre grooves that are kind of displaced a little bit. All that makes it very surprising and, and exciting to me. 
uh, as we said in the style topic, they are a mix of many styles in one person. Exactly. Exactly. About the lessons, if, some years ago, if we wanted to have lessons with our favorite player, it was very, very difficult, if not uh, impossible. Today, with the, with the online schools uh, and, and internet, it's a, it's a revolution, I think. Thomas, can you share with us something about your online drum school, the Thomas Lang Drum Universe? Uh, folks, check out the links, Thomas Lang Drum Universe. Yes, yeah, it's, uh, well, it's called Thomas Lang's Drum Universe. Um, and um, um, I started this school maybe, oh, I think five years ago. Um, and uh, I, I had a different online school before that for a couple of years with a company in Northern California that I worked with, but I decided then to you know, do my own thing and uh, design my own platform for it. Um, well, my online school is of course a subscription-based school where people can just, um, log in and and see what i uh present basically uh it's not an interactive school i don't do like live lessons or anything in the school i just have a lot of material on there that uh reflects kind of my practicing concepts and uh and our exercises that i used to practice um it is very clearly sort of divided into uh chapters and collections of exercises hand technique foot technique, you know, hand rudiments, foot rudiments, solo performances, creative applications of, uh, of uh, rudiments, for example, um, and uh, behind the scenes footage, you know, live touring footage, rehearsal footage. Um, and then there's, a, there's chapters like opinions and conversations where I talk about conceptual stuff, uh, how to prepare for a tour, you know, how to learn to read, um, how I memorize songs, you know, lots of stuff like that um, and little tricks, uh, you know, or, or specific things about my equipment and why I adjust certain things a certain way, my tuning, uh, pad exercises, stick control, all kinds of stuff. So, Great. Um, and it's all there and um, and you sign up and yeah, and then check out what's going on in the school and, and find something that you're interested in. And of course, you can always communicate with me if you have any questions, you know, you can email me and ask me anything. Um, or, you know, request certain things and I can point you in the right direction on the website and say, oh, what you're looking for is here or that's there. Um, or I make then in response specific videos that I upload that cover that topic. finishing Thomas how is your schedule what's next well next I am um, I've got a few more sessions um, in the, this month and next month for people from all over the world doing some album recordings here I think this month I still have three albums to record here in my studio um, I just finished one yesterday so I'm busy in the studio mainly uh, and then in April I'm gonna finish recording my uh, next solo album um, working with musicians all over the world and also here in Los Angeles who are playing on my songs and I'm recording a lot of you know, guitar players and bass players, some really great people. Uh, and I've already recorded all the drum tracks, so everything's done in the drum uh, department. So now I'm, I'm doing a lot of vocals, uh, bass and guitar overdubs. And uh, I'm planning to finish all that by the end of uh, April. So April is dedicated to my uh, solo album and then mixing and mastering. And um, uh, I'm also building a physical drum school and rehearsal rooms and a new studio here in Los Angeles. So that's very exciting for me. Um, I'm starting a, um, a, a drum school called Nine Beats USA here in the States. And um, I'm very excited about that because it's gonna be a great studio, a very nice facility. Uh, and I think it's very important to have a physical drum school because uh, I have experience with online schools and there's so much online stuff out there. I'm trying to go in a different direction and, and be hands-on and physical and actually have a physical location for students to come and to interact with the teacher, have one-on-one -on -one lessons and group lessons. I think that's very important. I've seen that over the years uh, in my camps, how important that is because you know, you can never replace, um, you know, the sort of the human touch and interaction, the social element 
with any anything online. Um, and as much as I, you know, think online education is important, I think it's best in combination with real one-on-one -on -one education. So I'm very excited about Nine Beats USA, and um, and then um, I'm planning I'm planning you know the big drum bonanza again this year here in Los Angeles, July 17th to the 21st. If you can come, all my friends in Spain, come. Uh, it's going to be really exciting. We have some amazing guests this year. So that's going to be very exciting. And then I have, you know, tours planned for the for the year. I'm, I'm in France for some camps. I'm in China again for a solo tour. Uh, I'm in Vietnam and Korea and Singapore and Taiwan in, in June. So I'm, I'm very busy. I have a very busy summer, lots of touring. Um, and uh, I try to mix it up, recording, touring, teaching. Thomas, it's been a real pleasure having you here. Thanks uh, for your words, your great information, your passion. I wish you the best on the road, family, your projects, music. Thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you very much, Juan. Thank you, and to you too. Yeah, we will follow you, folks. Mr. Thomas Lang, ciao, amigo. Thank you, ciao.